In this series of videos, we will try to strip away some of the mysticism that surrounds quantum mechanics and discuss what it is that quantum mechanics purports to actually exist in the real world. Our approach is going to be to start from purely empirical data, that is, experiments that can be carried out and actually are carried out. We'll approach these experiments in as theory-neutral way as possible and try to piece together a physical theory that can account for all the observations we see. And that theory is what will turn out to be the theory of quantum mechanics. So firstly, why is there this sense of mysticism surrounding quantum mechanics? Well, it turns out that what the average student learns in the textbook is not really a precisely defined physical theory at all, but rather a recipe for how to use quantum mechanics to make predictions about the real world. Students get taught a bunch of different equations and formulas, and then how and when to apply them. And that's what's called using the quantum recipe for making predictions. And for all practical purposes, like designing microchips or predicting the outcome of experiments, this ability to use the quantum recipe is all we actually need. So what is the problem with this quantum recipe? Well, the physicist John Stuart Bell, who is actually quite a big deal in quantum mechanics, had this to say. He said that the conventional formalisms of quantum theory are unprofessionally vague and ambiguous. Professional theoretical physics ought to be able to do better. And what Bell is trying to say is that the, the basis of quantum theory is actually built on very, very vague and imprecise terms. These are terms like observer and apparatus and measurement. And that is really not an ideal situation to be in because you're supposed to have this objective physical theory that describes exactly what exists and yet its foundations are built on really vague terms which are impossible to define properly. Let's take the term observer as an example. Uh, we'll see in the next video and subsequent videos one of the most bizarre elements of quantum mechanics where the outcome of an experiment we carry out is literally different whether we observe that experiment or not. Now this is a really weird thing to get your head around, right? Because whether an experiment gives one result or another should not change depending on whether a human being is looking at it. It seems to put an almost godlike role on this observer. The observer is someone who can literally change how the universe works depending on what they're looking at at any given time. Um, and moreover than that, it's an incredibly vague term as well. I mean, who or what can this observer be? Einstein used to quip that could a single cell organism act as an observer and change the universe? Or could a mouse, by looking at an experiment, change the outcome? Or did the universe have to wait a little longer, perhaps, for someone with a PhD to show up? Anyway, this is hardly an ideal scenario to be in, right? Where our physical theory hinges on this sort of mythical observer, which we can't really particularly define. A physical theory ought to be able to do better than that. A physical theory ought to be able to say what exists and how it behaves. And that is what we're going to try to articulate in this series. We are going to look at actual phenomena. We are going to approach that phenomena in as theory neutral a way as possible. And then we are going to construct a simple physical theory that can account for all the phenomena we see. And we are going to try and omit words like observer and measurement and apparatus. We are trying to keep our terms simple and precise, things that actually exist and how those things behave. So on to our first experiment. And this experiment takes place in this apparatus, which we call a cathode ray tube. And this is what it's composed of. So over here we have a battery and then batteries have two ends, one positive and one negative. And we attach each of these ends to these metal plates that are plates that where electricity can flow freely. So the negative end we connect to this plate that becomes negatively charged. We call that the cathode. The positive end we connect to this plate that becomes positively charged. We call that the anode. And in the anode we have an aperture. Now an aperture is just a fancy word for a hole. Um, then we place this whole thing inside a vacuum tube, so all the air sucked out. And then at this end, we have a phosphor coated screen. And finally, connected to the cathode, we have a variable heating element. 
that is a heating element which we can turn the voltage up and down on to provide more or less heat to the cathode. So what do we see when we turn this all on? Well, when we turn up the heating element to a very high voltage, we put a lot of heat into the system in this cathode, what we see is that on this phosphor screen, a bright white spot appears. And that spot is roughly the same size and shape as the aperture, the hole, in the anode. And then what happens as we turn the voltage down on the heating element is that this bright white spot becomes dimmer and dimmer. And as we continue to turn the voltage down, eventually the spot disappears altogether. And instead, we have a number of individual flashes occurring on this screen. But importantly, all of those flashes occur in exactly the same region as the initial bright spot. And as we continue to turn the voltage down, the flashes become even more um, rare and infrequent. And as we get to a very low voltage, we only get very, very infrequent flashes. But the important point to note here is that all the flashes occur in exactly the same circular region as the initial bright spot at high voltage. So what can we learn from this experiment? Well, the fact that when we supply heat into the system, we get a bright steady spot on the phosphor screen, which is roughly the same size and shape as the aperture in the anode, suggests that something is traveling from the cathode through the hole in the anode and hitting the phosphor covered screen. Now that might seem like a very basic thing to say, but remember that's the whole point. We are trying to build up a theory from the ground up and from observation alone. Now, there's one further hypothesis which is suggested at this point, that because this bright steady spot, as we turn the voltage down, becomes a series of individual flashes, that suggests that whatever is traveling from the cathode through the anode and hitting the screen are individual particles. That is, as we get the voltage down as we supply less energy into the system, we get fewer and fewer of these flashes until we supply just a little bit of energy, we get one thing going from the cathode through the aperture, hitting the screen, making one flash. And these objects, which we hypothesize are particles traveling from the cathode and hitting the screen, are what we come to call electrons. Now, it might seem very hard to refute this picture of electrons as particles from what we see in this experiment. But at this stage, we do have to resist it, because although the idea of electrons as particles is suggested by this experiment and what we see here, it does not actually form part of the data itself. It is merely suggested by the data. And furthermore, in the next experiment we're about to see, and other experiments, we are going to get a very different picture of electrons. We are going to get an idea of electrons not as particles at all, but instead as waves moving through space. So, if individual particles are flying from the cathode to the screen as we believe, then theoretically we should be able to affect these particles by placing some object in between the cathode and the screen. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this experiment. What we're going to do is we are going to place a barrier in between the cathode and the screen, and in this barrier we are going to have a long but very thin slit. So. When the particles, theoretically, hit this barrier, they will be unable to travel through the solid part of the barrier, which I've shaded in, and they will only be able to go through this slit, and we are going to place this barrier right over here. Right. So now, particles are coming from the cathode through the aperture in the anode and hitting this barrier before going onto the screen, and we want to know what we see in this. So, what we see at first is, just like we would expect, Initially, without the barrier, we had this bright spot on the screen, right? So uh, that's roughly a spot the same size and shape as the anode. But then, when we include this barrier, what we find instead is that the pattern on this screen goes from being a bright spot to being a, a long slit, exactly as we would expect, right? It mirrors the slit in the, um, in the barrier here, because anything which is hitting the sides of this gets cut off, and this is perfectly consistent with our picture of electrons as particles. But hang on. What we're going to do next is, we are going to make the width of this slit thinner. And when we do that, what we notice at first is that the simply the pattern gets thinner, right? 
And again, that is exactly as we would expect. As we make the slit thinner, the pattern on the screen gets thinner. Again, this is still totally consistent with the idea that electrons are particles. Um, but then, what we notice when we make the slit extremely thin is very, very unexpected. When the slit gets thin enough past some certain threshold, what we actually see on the screen is not a simple image of the hole in the barrier. What we actually see is a much, much wider pattern, which starts off very bright in the center and then gets much dimmer the further away from the center we go. Now, this is highly unexpected, right? This is not at all what we would expect from the idea of electrons as particles. In fact, this phenomenon is reminiscent of a property of waves, a property called diffraction. Now, I don't want to spend too much time going over diffraction, um, but maybe go away and look that up in a separate video because it is really interesting. But what we find with diffraction is that when we have a series of waves, um, and when these waves, going in this direction over here, um, when they approach some barrier, um, what we find is that when the barrier is very wide, like it is here, these waves continue as plane waves going through, like so. Um, but what we find when we make the, uh, the hole through which the waves are traveling uh, very short, or very narrow, sorry, is that once they go through the hole, they don't actually behave like plane waves at all, but instead they spread out in a circular pattern like this, and they spread out much wider than they were before. And that's what we're seeing here, right? What we are seeing here is that once we make the width of the slit narrow enough, we go from having a perfect image of the slit on the screen to once we get past a certain threshold of narrowness, having a much wider image on the screen, right? The, the waves spread out much further in all directions. Now this is behavior which is totally inconsistent with the idea of electrons as particles, and in fact, suggests that electrons are not particles at all, but waves. But hang on, because things get weirder still, right? Because remember, in the first experiment, we turned the voltage on the heating element down and we found that the pattern went from being a bright, steady spot to a series of individual flashes. So now we're going to ask, what happens when we have this single slit in the way and we turn the heating element voltage down? Well, as before, we notice that the bright, steady state becomes a series of flashes. And when we have a wide slit, like here, um, all these flashes occur in the same wide image of the slit which we initially had on the screen. But when we go to a very narrow slit, these flashes suddenly become much more spread out again. And again, this mirrors the diffraction pattern we get at, at, um, at high voltage. So wherever the diffraction pattern appears on this screen, that is where our flashes occur. And that occurs when we have a wide slit and a very narrow pattern on the screen, or a very narrow slit and a very wide pattern on the screen. Wherever we see the pattern at high voltage, that is where the flashes will appear at low voltage. So, why is this a problem? Well, what we have here, seemingly, is really quite a fundamental contradiction at work. So some of these phenomena um, suggest that electrons are particles and have behavior inconsistent with them being waves, whereas other phenomena suggest that electrons are waves and have uh, properties inconsistent with them being particles. And that is a total contradiction because particles and waves are two very different physical objects. So how can one physical object, the electron, have properties of both of these at the same time? And this is what's called wave-particle duality in quantum mechanics, and it was one of the first big, big conceptual challenges for quantum mechanics to try and answer. Now, in the next experiment, we are going to cover the double-slit experiment and we'll cover that both with and without observation. And that is probably my favorite experiment in the entirety of physics. And the things it tells us about the nature of reality are completely mind boggling. Um, but once we see that and a couple more experiments, we will then be in a position to start to build up a physical theory that can account 
for all these seemingly contradictory things we see in the various experiments.